for the touch of your lips, dear, but much more for the touch of your whips, dear. You can raise welts like nobody else as we dance to the masochism tango. All right, everybody, welcome to Ourgasm. This is the podcast where we talk about decolonizing sexuality and gender. I am Lindsay G. I use she, her, or they, them pronouns. And I am Lenny Peppers. I use she, her pronouns. And uh, this week, we're going to be talking about beauty standards, which is a huge topic. So we're going to, you know, scratch the surface. Uh, But before we get into it, Lenny has something that she would like to read. In this podcast... We use the heteronormative terms of gender binary of men and women under the understanding that there are agender, androgynous, bigender, pangender, and gender fluid norms that exist outside of cisnormativity. While we tend to use the male and female as shorthand, this is not meant to undermine the very serious role of colonization in violence against two-spirit and non-conforming individuals. Even more so, this is not meant to obscure the reality that two-spirit and non-conforming people are the most likely to experience sexual violence, as we have mentioned in earlier episodes. We do not believe in the gender binary without fluidity, which is a Euro-Western construct that forced a strict gender division on our societies, which itself is a form of violence. Absolutely. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, That is going to save us significant time when we're recording each episode where like universally at some point one of us has to be like, hang on, hang on, hang on. Don't get mad, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) We're using these terms with the understanding that they don't apply to everyone. We're not mad at you, you know, etc. So uh, thank you very much for writing that. Uh, And yes, We heartily agree that diversity is, you know, what makes this world a wonderful place. And we don't want to be using restrictive language any more than we have to. Um, But, you know, that is, that's kind of the nature of the English language and many other languages. There's just not always the right language to use to include everyone that you want to. Um, so we we do try hard to use inclusive language where we can, but it's not always something that we can do. So, right. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I just think it's like really, really important to understand that we don't believe in a simple like binary yeah. gender division or like really many binary positions at all. Actually, uh, we just don't see the world that way. So, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I one thing that like I tend to geek out about is uh, looking into like scientific research, um, especially as it pertains to sexuality. And I am always disappointed in the research that I find, because like if you're talking about like uh, the way that brains work, it's always, always broken down to male and female groups. There's like almost never any mention of trans folks or non-binary folks or anyone. And I understand why the scientific community tends to go that way. You know, there's always, you have to think about where your funding is coming from and what those people want you to be researching. Um, and uh, most of the time you, you need a relatively large sample size and it can be very hard to select for, you know, non cis male and non-cis female people. There's a lot of reasons for it, but I feel like once our scientific research has expanded to include people who don't exist on the far ends of, you know, this quote-unquote binary, we're going to understand so much more about ourselves, and I am so excited for that to happen. Also, jokes on you, society. We pay for this out of our own pockets. Ha! (laughs) So we could say whatever we want. You don't own us. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but like, not just but gender binaries, but uh, I mean, we market this show as like decolonizing sexuality and gender. And what it comes down to is like, we don't even believe in the colonized to decolonized binary either. Like, I don't see the world in that way, even though that's the way that like, as a Native American, 
everything is written, colonized Mm. versus decolonized. And then also, I mean, even though we describe ourselves in like, like a way that suggests that everything is colonized, um, I don't necessarily see individuals as being that way. Oh, that's interesting. I want to talk more about that. Maybe we could do a whole episode on that concept at some point because I'm intrigued. Yeah. Um, I definitely do not have the language around that to do that in this episode. Though. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, we can put that off for another time, but I definitely want to talk about it because um, I find that like and just in, in like social circles of mine, um, there's confusion over what even the concept of decolonizing sexuality means. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that, you know, just for a lot of people in like the broader world, decolonization as a concept is still relatively new and some people are not acquainted with it at all. So looking even farther, like beyond the concept of colonized versus decolonized and breaking that down is like, totally wild territory and i'm very excited to explore it let's put it in the context of a western film we only have the colonized and the colonizer and there's also like this binary of like good and evil or um pure and unpure or you know Right. And so there's always, like, as a Native American, we have gaslit into, like, believing that we live in all of these different binaries and that we walk on, like, this line and we have to choose between worlds. Like, are we going to live in, like, mm. the white world? Or are we going to live in the Native world? And when it comes down to it, like, that line doesn't exist. It doesn't exist for gender. It doesn't exist for humans. There is no line. We can exist in whatever realm we want to exist in. I could be a Native American who, you know, lives in the city while at the same time still, you know, practicing, you know, our traditional values. And there is no line there that tells me how Indian or how not Indian I am. And so that's what I mean when I say like when we're talking about decolonizing something, we're actually pushing it like more into a realm of where these two ideas aren't what defines us. Okay, yeah, I see. I see. That's a really, really beautiful idea. And I really like the there is no line concept. Like that's like, that's your Neo moment where the line ceases to exist and now you can fly. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) You can do whatever you want. (laughs) It's so exhausting, though, because, like, as, you know, as cool as it may seem to, like, kind of break down that line and, like, realize that it's not there, everything that I read still draws that line. Mm -hmm. Uh, Every academic journal that I read, every uh, book, even just book that I read that is like for fun that has Native Americans in it has like this implied line of like what right. is and isn't real when it comes to your identity. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking of like all these people that I see on TikTok. Like, I'm not going to remember the guy's name. Um, TikTok is not very good for remembering people's names. But there's this one guy who um, did this little sketch about like, like, he's just sitting in, like, a restaurant, like, talking with his friends, having a completely normal conversation, and then, like, somebody walks in and is like, oh, my God, it's a Native American. And he, like, immediately, like, code switches. Yeah. And, like, flute music starts playing, and he starts <laughs> talking about the eagle soaring in the sky. And, like, that's that's the binary right there, right? Like, existing as a person. hmm And then performing as the traditional Native American that makes you really Native. Mm-hmm. That does sound exhausting. But it did make a very funny TikTok, so. <laughs> I mean, and is the basis for most of my comedy. So, I mean, right? <laughs> it's definitely something that I like. We can laugh at. But I think, in a way, that like 
breaks down that whole idea. I hope so. I hope that my uh, my tendency to try to make a joke when I feel either vulnerable because I fucked up or vulnerable because like you just said something that went really deep and I have no idea how to follow it. <laughs> I hope that that does not get overtly offensive, but please, if it does, feel free to call me out on it. Like, especially on this show, I want us to be examples of how to like own it when you say something that offends someone, if that happens. Like, absolutely. I, I feel like a, Actually, like an important part of the decolonizing conversation is white people learning to get over themselves a little bit. And I mean, as a white person who has like all kinds of privilege in our culture, like I can definitely say that is it's hard to do. It's hard to be told that you fucked up and to just say, I am really sorry I did that and move forward. Um, and it's especially hard to do it without without expecting the person that you offended to educate you about it. Like, I definitely know that I do these things, and I definitely know that I make jokes about things when I feel uncomfortable um, or I just don't know what else to say. So, yeah, if I do cross a line, I very much hope that you will feel comfortable enough to tell me about it, and then we can try to, you know make good habits around that and and show our listeners that would be that's a goal for me anyway <laughs> absolutely i think you can say that we are comfortable with being uncomfortable like stepping outside the box and kind of knowing that that's where all of the like good learning happens right yeah but it is still it is still uncomfortable to be uncomfortable and i want to be like honest about that and just let everyone know that yeah when i make an awkward joke sometimes that's where it's coming from um sorry everybody but hopefully at least the jokes are like somewhat funny so <laughs> that's that's another goal of mine i want to be a little funny sometimes it's so weird though because being able to like step outside of your comfort zone and to then to be able to admit that like there's been you know a mistake made or whatever is something like I rarely ever see. And I think that's what I appreciate about like being in a relationship with you and James, because I mean, we are all humans and we can all make, make mistakes. Uh, I actually came across this earlier today. Uh, I was in my um, social justice and anthropology course that I'm taking at the university and um, we had been given four academic journals to read over the weekend to discuss in class today. And all four of these journals kind of centered around um, colonization in anthropology and specifically um, like in the, na like with Native Americans. Okay. And so we had these four journals, we read them for class, and then we talked, discussed them in class. And um, at the end of the class, one of the students, also Native American, brought up um, the fact that all of these journals had been written by non-Natives. And we're talking about Native Americans, but we're not Native Americans talking about ourselves. Right. In 2020. Yeah. And the professor was like, that is my fault, and I will try and do better in the future. <laughs> wow, okay, cool. But I mean, her instant, like, instantly, like, she started to make a, like, a excuse for why that was, but then ultimately she just dropped the excuse in the end and was like, no, that's not good enough. I'm going to do better. Uh, and the excuse was, like, there aren't really that many Native American anthropologists who, like, write about these kinds of things. And then it came down to, like, nope, that's not good enough. Like, she fully admitted that she could have looked a little bit harder for 